Hello, Global Gardeners. It's great to have everybody here today. Lots of activity, lots of questions so far on the stream. It's great to see everybody. Let's jump into one that just popped up from Susan Suing asking about fungus nets in seedling pots. And I still have hundreds of seedlings under lights. I've I started hardening off some plants as well and fungus gnats are starting to pop up again with the newer ones. They're often caused when the soil gets too wet and stays wet. And so one of the ways you can deal with fungus gnats is just to let the surface of your seedling pots dry out a little bit. You should see a drastic reduction. You can sprinkle a little cinnamon. I've talked about this before. Cinnamon has some antifungal properties which kind of takes away their food. Or what I do is just accept it. Fungus gnats tend to be one of those things that we have when we start seedlings indoors. They're really not going to cause any problems with your plants and in the normal small numbers that we see them. But let the surface dry out. That's typically what I'll do. I'll water from the bottom. Once the seedlings start growing pretty well, let the surface dry out between waterings and it really cuts down on the fungus gnats. Hello to everyone Check is checking in. Doris is checking in from Michigan. Pauline in New Mexico. Barbara Finley, good morning to you. Laura Full is checking in from Eastwood Pass. And coincidentally, Laura Full, I watched Back to the Future with my brother and his family this weekend as part of his birthday celebration. So interesting coincidence about Eastwood Pass. One, not three. Dennis, good to see you as well from rainy Denver. I'm about 45 minutes south of Denver and it's actually snowing here. I've got a couple inches of snow on the ground and the garden is really getting a nice soaking. It was raining yesterday, snow, and then it's gonna be turning into rain. So it's, it's wonderful when those of us in dry conditions can have the rain and the snow as our plants are starting to emerge. Gonna be talking a lot about soil today. Already have some great questions about soil. Steve Balk is using 30 gallon grow pots and wants to reuse the soil. Great idea. You can reuse soil in your grow pots, your grow bags, your containers. And the question is, is azomite good to help recondition the soil? And it's a really good question. A couple different things that we'll touch on here. Yes, you should recondition the soil in your containers and your pots each year if you can. Now, specifically about azomite. Azomite is inorganic. It's a, a combination of minerals that's mined in Utah and then shipped all around the world. And so it depends on what kind of soil blend you have in the containers from last year. If you used a mineral-based soil, your native soil, if you used azomite last year, if you used rock dust, then chances are you don't need those elements that are contained in azomite because many people think of it as a fertilizer, but it's really not a fertilizer. This is extremely slow release, elemental improvement of your soil. And so think about it that way. It's not a fertilizer. And if you want to reinvigorate or revitalize your soil, azomite isn't going to do that. It will add a mineral component that plants need. If those minerals are already in place, azomite may add some macro or some micronutrients, but it's not going to add the macronutrients. It doesn't have nitrogen, it doesn't have phosphorus, it doesn't have potassium. I think a better way and really a way that you should consistently consider, those of you that are growing in containers and pots, is to add organic matter every year as you're seeking to revitalize the soil. And that holds true not just for pots and containers, but for your raised beds as well. It's just in the containers, we typically have less of that, that soil microbe activity, and we might have fewer minerals depending on what kind of mix. So if you've got a soilless mix where it's peat and compost and perlite, then you might want to add azomite because it will add the minerals. But if it's a, a mineral-rich environment already, 
then azomite probably won't add a lot in the way of benefits. And Mage Grey Wolf was wondering about my thoughts on compost tea to help provide a fast boost of nutrients for seedlings. And you might remember this, I haven't talked a lot about it. I'm not a huge fan of compost tea in general. If you think about it this way, the compost tea is made from compost. And compost has microbial action, it has nutrients, and when we put it into our soil, we're getting 100% of all of that activity and all of those nutrients that's in our compost and we're adding it to our soil. If we take a little bit of compost and put it in a bucket of water, we're now diluting all of that beneficial activity and the nutrients. <clears throat> and so generally in the garden, compost tea, I don't think really adds much in the way of benefits. Now, I have seen some studies that say when you use it as a foliar spray, it can cut down on some fungal activity. But as far as a soil improvement, I think compost by itself is far better than using compost tea. Because essentially every time it rains and every time you water, the compost in the soil leaches out the nutrients and is a more uh, condensed version of a compost tea. Now, let's switch to the question about seedlings and whether compost tea could be beneficial. It might. It shouldn't harm your plants in any way. And especially for young seedlings, as I've mentioned in the past, if you're going to fertilize them, you should fertilize with a diluted fertilizer. And that's what compost tea is, essentially, a very diluted fertilizer. So as far as a quick boost, I don't think compost tea really gives a quick boost to seedlings that you might be growing in little pots but it might add some nutrient needs that your plants are lacking. Uh, it depends on the soil, it depends on your potting mix, it depends on if there's any fertilizer in that mix already. I, I do think the gardeners in general that really like compost tea and tout the benefits, it falls to one of my basic philosophies, which is a good garden grows where a good gardener goes. And so if you're taking the time to make compost tea, and if you're taking the time to, to add compost tea to your plants and soil, chances are you're doing all of those other things that the plants are benefiting from. And so you might be thinking it's the compost tea that's really improving your plants, but in my opinion, in my philosophy, it's all those other things you do, and compost tea just takes the credit. As far as the seedlings, again, go ahead and try some compost tea if you don't have any other fertilizer in your mix and it can't hurt, it might give a little bit of a boost. And that ties right in with another question that we had from Mark Trimble asking about tomato seedlings that have a little bit of purple, they're curling that he noticed after watering and wondering if he should add fertilizer with a mix that already has fertilizer in it. Now, first off, purple leaves on tomatoes, the, the young seedlings, perfectly normal. It's one of those things that, that, that you'll see a lot. The question about curling of leaves, most often curling leaves is caused by a water issue. Too much water or too little water. And so if you noticed it right after watering, it could be that you watered too much. The soil was saturated, you pushed out a lot of the oxygen that was in the soil pores and the plant reacted by curling the leaves. I'm hesitant to add more fertilizer in a soil that already has fertilizer in it. And so anytime you see something like that with curling leaves after you've watered a plant, wait a little bit and see if it recovers. See if it's the older leaves that have curled or the new young leaves that have curled. Because when there's a water issue in a plant, it's usually the older leaves that will, will curl first. And so if the newer, younger leaves are not curling, then the plant is getting back into balance and things are okay. Take a look at what kind of nutrients you have. You say the fertilizer is already in the soil. 
If it's a balanced fertilizer in the soil, then no, you shouldn't really add any more, especially for seedlings because they prefer to have a diluted fertilizer and too much fertilizer can cause stress on the plant and potentially lead to some of those curling issues. So have a little bit of patience with all of your seedlings all the time, whether it's fungus gnats or fertilizer or curling or color changes. The seedlings are growing so quickly and they're responding or reacting so quickly to what we do to them that often if you just wait a few hours or wait a day or two, most of those conditions will correct themselves. There you have it. A couple quick answers. Let's see what else we have. LP is asking, do you have experience growing summer squash in a pot? Was it successful? Thank you. I do have some experience with that. It was mildly successful. Um, squashes can send out a pretty robust root system depending on the squash. And so I've had better luck with my summer squashes that are growing in the ground because they've got space to spread and often the container is a little limiting. And so uh, one thing I have tried, and it has worked pretty well, in an area if you have a limited space in your garden is you can grow summer squash in five gallon buckets. And then I put those buckets up against a trellis. And so growing like yellow squashes up a trellis out of five gallon buckets can be a pretty successful uh, way to, to spread the, the space in your garden. If you've got a back corner that you're not using, you can definitely grow some summer squashes in a bucket and grow them vertically up a trellis and you've just gained a whole extra spot, especially if it's in an area where you can't put a bed but you've got space to grow. So uh, they do okay. Okay, it gets back to that, that basic issue I was talking about as far as the soil within your container. You, know, you want to make sure that it's nice and rich and, and filled with nutrients for the squash to do best. It's another issue that is more difficult when you're growing squashes or melons or any type of, of fruiting plant in a bucket or container is that those containers tend to dry out faster than a, a raised bed or an in-ground bed for sure. And those plants all require a pretty substantial amount of water to fruit. If you think about melons and squashes and tomatoes, the fruit itself has a lot of water in it, which means the soil needs to stay evenly moist to be able to provide water for that fruit. So when you grow squashes in a container, just try to avoid allowing the soil to dry out so that you can get all that fruit development. So let's see, Marsha Davenport had asked earlier if there's any raised garden crops that should not be mulched. And I can't really think of any. I think mulch is very important to help protect the soil. And if you're using an, an organic mulch, it can be turned back into the soil at the end of the season in most cases to help amend it for the following season. And so I'm a huge advocate of mulch, and I've got a couple of videos where I talk about that. You, you can get away with not mulching in areas where you have spreading plants. So for instance, the summer squashes. If you've got a vining summer squash that you're not growing vertically, and instead you're letting it spread across the ground, you really don't have to have mulch because the leaves of that plant will shade the soil They'll moderate the temperature. They'll help reduce the, so the water evaporation. It provides a lot of the benefits that a mulch will provide. And so a spreading plant, a vining plant that's growing horizontally, you really don't have to mulch. I still prefer to mulch all of my squashes and melons and plants that are growing that way. But that might be one of the few types that I would say you can get away without the mulch and still get many of the same benefits from it. And Frank Anselmo was wondering about effective ways to deal with cutworms in beds that are already planted, where you've already got plants. Now, I think one of the most effective ways to deal with cutworms is just to disrupt the soil, either in the fall or the spring. You disrupt their life cycle, you, you uh, disturb the larva, and you'll have fewer issues with the cutworm. But if you haven't done that and the plants are starting to grow, you, you, you'll probably see this if you do a search of, of different techniques to deal with cutworms. And one way to do it is to protect each individual plant. And so you can take a toilet paper tube and put it around the stem. You can take 
foil and loosely wrap it around the stem. Because the reason they're called cutworms is when they emerge from the soil, they start chomping away at the stem and they cut it right down. If you can put some type of barrier around the stem so that when the cutworms emerge, they don't have anything to eat, you'll definitely disrupt their life cycle because now they're not able to eat and might die from starvation. But as far as your plants are concerned, you're protecting your plants from that damage. Now, depending on what you're growing, it can be a lot of effort and a lot of work to wrap all those individual plants or put something around them to keep the larva from uh, attacking the plant. But that's, that's one of the most effective and easiest ways to do it. You can get some nematodes to put in your soil, but that tends to take a little bit longer for, for those nematodes to uh, attack the cutworms. And depending on when you do it, it, it may be worthless. You may put nematodes in the soil to deal with the cutworms, and then by the time the nematodes get active, the cutworms have already emerged. So uh, that, that could be something that, that you could consider. Diatomaceous earth might have some benefit to it, um, but the barrier method is, is really kind of the tried and true method to, to deal with those. Lily's asking, something is eating the tops of my beans as soon as they sprout. What can I do? You can get out there and monitor 24 hours with a flashlight and try to find what it is. Um, or you can just look for uh, other uh, indications of what that pest might be. It could be a vole, it could be a mouse, it could be uh, many uh, different types of animals. It could be a caterpillar, it could be some other type of insect. It's really hard to say. I've had that issue before where I thought it was an insect and then I discovered later by finding tracks and seeing other uh, examples of what it was that it was an animal that was eating the tops of my plants. Whatever it is, I would suggest go ahead and cover it uh, or cover the plants. And, and you can do that uh, in a number of different ways. This is one of those issues that bird netting will probably not work. And so you might want to use a denser material like a row fabric cover and put that over your plants. That way you can see if you put a cover over your plants and the plants are still being eaten, then it's probably not an animal coming from the outside. It's probably an insect coming from the inside. And so now you've narrowed it down to, to half as many pests as you had before. You can also try putting like some gallon milk jugs, plastic jugs with the bottom cut off. Put those over your plants as a protection as well. So try to protect the plants, try to cover the plants, try to keep those pests away. But during the whole process, see if you can identify what the pest is and then that will give you a way to target it. Because if you do some of the, 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 so the insect corrective actions like neem oil and diatomaceous earth, that, that might have zero effect if it's a mouse that's doing the eating. And so it really comes down to trying to identify exactly what the best is and you'll get the best results from it. Ellen says, hello from the bluegrass state. Hello back to you. Growing an, an Ohio melon sweet passion cantaloupe. That sounds great. What is the best way to grow them? In ground, container, raised bed? Do you ever tell us them? Uh, all of the above can act, you know, like we are talking about earlier with growing the summer squash in containers. You can definitely grow them in containers. I've had best results in raised beds and in ground beds when growing melons. And I think there's a couple reasons for that. The, the soil temperature tends to stay more consistent in a raised bed and in an in ground bed. The soil moisture tends to stay more consistent as, as compared to containers. And yes, trellising is a great option. And I've trellised a number of different melons. <clears throat> I have a video on uh, what I consider to be the best tomato trellis, but I've also used that same trellis for melons and it's been extremely effective. And so a lot of it depends on how much space you have, how big your garden is, as to whether you can allow melons to spread out across the ground, which is a very effective way to grow melons because like I said earlier, the leaves act as a mulch to moderate the temperature and moderate the moisture, and the plant tends to do a little bit better when it can spread out. But you can grow more plants in a smaller area if you grow vertically, which means a bigger harvest. So all of that can work. 
uh, especially if you're new to growing melons and squashes, I would suggest if you've got more than one bed that you're growing these plants in, try a couple different methods. In one bed, grow vertically, and in another bed, grow horizontally. And then at the end of the season, make notes in your journal about what you like best. And then next year, you can continue on with whichever method you prefer. I think that's how a lot of us that have been doing this for a number of years really help refine our own techniques and gardening methods is because we try different things. We see which one we prefer, and then we kind of move in that direction. And I definitely encourage it. So uh, do some vertical growing in beds and do some horizontal growing in the ground and be the judge for yourself. Okay, Vanessa's saying, I put a protector used for picnics to protect my plants from getting eaten. It's made of a mesh and looks like a square umbrella. Awesome. Uh, I, I love doing that. I did that um, one year. I had a, um, a big umbrella, like uh, covering the, the patio, and the, the pole broke, and I did the same thing. Uh, and one of the, the, uh, the supports of the umbrella broke as well. And so I just took it off of the pole and covered a big area and things like that that you can reuse can be very effective. So good for you. Taco Promotions is saying, I have a large passion fruit and the leaves are getting out to pieces. Um, oh, just escaped, I have to go back up. I originally thought this was the caterpillars from the butterflies, but I also see browning along the leaves. So if they're being cut to pieces, then yes, it's probably uh, a problem with caterpillars. Um, that's that's the mo most likely cause. There it could actually be something like a leaf cutter bee, depending on what kind of cuts they are. As far as the browning, once a plant gets stressed like that, if it's had a lot of damage, even a tree, and then you have some severe weather, wind. Usually, it's it's going to be a hot sun sunny day. You'll often see browning because. The plant is trying to recover, it's trying to send out some new growth, and then you have a blazing sun that causes sun scald and sunburn, and the result of that is often browning tips. Uh, or it could be that the insect, if it was a caterpillar, damaged the stem or the branch a little farther back, and that has caused the leaves on that branch to start being stressed and start showing some brown edges. So, I think there's a couple different issues there. Try to figure out uh, indeed if it is a caterpillar and then look at the whole health of the tree and see if the browning of the leaves is uh, in, in just certain areas of the tree or in the whole tree. And that can help determine exa exactly what the cause is. Because it could also be a uh, watering issue, fertilization issue, contamination of the soil. There's a lot of stuff that can cause the browning of the issue. But take a closer look and see if you can identify just exactly how widespread it is. And then that might help identify where where the problem is coming from. Lily's saying, I'm trying a new garden area with weed fabric to prevent weeds and retain moisture. Do you recommend I put straw on top to reduce heat? Um, I do. I, I did some um, mulching with plastic in years past. And it, I, I grew tomatoes and peppers in one bed in particular where I had used a, a black cover on the soil and it burned the plants. Uh, the heat just built up so much in that soil. It's very effective at killing weeds, but if you want to grow in it, it's going to be very effective at killing the plants that you're growing in that area too. So if you put a fabric down for weed control, and then you're going to cut slits into it and put your plants in. Yes, I would definitely consider mulching with straw or some other material. Wood chips will work okay in a situation like that because they're not actually being incorporated into the soil. And that will help cool the soil, moderate the temperature, and your plants should do better in a situation like that. So um, good question. Definitely something to, to think about. Uh, okay, let's see what else we have popping up. Elsa saying, my sunflowers, leaves... I have a lot of holes. I believe it's caterpillars. Is there a way to prevent that? Uh, so if you know you have a caterpillar problem, one of the best ways to deal with caterpillars is to use Bt, Bacillus thuringiensis. And there's a couple different types of Bt depending on what kind of 
insect you're trying to control. But there are some great uh, BTs. You usually you usually don't find them at the big box stores. You'll have to go to a nursery or order online. But uh, very effective. The caterpillar will eat the leaves. That that bacillus. It's a bacteria. Will get into the bacteria or will get into the stomach of the caterpillar and kill it. And so that's a very effective way. Um, you might have some sex, success depending on the type of caterpillar by using diatomaceous earth that you spread on the leaves. Neem oil might work. Um, I've had mixed results with neem oil on leaves with caterpillars chewing them, mainly just because as soon as it rains, uh, the, the neem oil tends to dissipate or it dries out. And it's so hard to cover the, all of the leaves of a plant with neem oil. But there's a couple different ideas. Um, BT is one of the most effective ways. Also, especially if it's a big caterpillar, this is the way I used to, to do it at the school garden in the greenhouse when we would get caterpillars, is just get a group of people together and try to pluck all the caterpillars off by hand. Especially if you don't want to use any type of, of compound or chemical uh, or spray. You might be able to pick them off by hand and decimate the population enough that they become less of a problem. And I remember one day on the tomatoes, we were growing tomatoes vertically in the greenhouse, a couple dozen tomatoes. I think we had four or five students and me, and we pulled off like 80 caterpillars by hand. And if we had used BT or diatomaceous earth or a spray, it takes time for those materials to work and kill the insect. And so we would have had 80 caterpillars continue to munch for at least a day, maybe two, before they were affected by those control measures. And they would have done a lot more damage. So often just using manual control and plucking them off by hand is a good way to, to deal with them. <clears throat> yeah, Yannette Dixon is saying um, combines BT and neem oil when spraying. There you go. That's a good idea, a good way to get the benefits of both. Thanks. Uh, Laura says, I have to re-listen to this one later. I have a lot of great information today. Can take, can't take it all in right now. And, and I, I say this often. That's what's so great about doing this is you can watch it on replay. I'll give a shout out to my daughter, Kiri, because she does most of the effort for, for getting the information back to you. It usually takes three or four days, usually by the end of the week, we will have all of this information in a timestamp in the description. And so if you go back to all of my previous uh, live feeds, you'll see in the description the timestamp. So if I'm talking about BT and neem oil, or if I'm talking about uh, any of the other issues that we've been talking about today, the container growing, the soil, the seedlings, well, by this weekend, there will be timestamps. And so you can go back, and if there's a topic that interests you, you can just click on that time and that topic, and it'll take you right to the discussion. And, and so you can go back to all of my other live streams, the same thing. If you kind of remember that we talked about something at some time in a previous live stream, just go to my library on the Gardner Scott YouTube channel and go to the the videos with the live streams and start clicking on one and you can see all the topics and click on whichever topic you want. So by all means, listen to this in its entirety, but in days ahead, you'll have that opportunity to just go straight to the topic that interests you. Kevin says, I have to watch replay to catch up on what I'm saying because I'm talking in chat. Exactly, you know, and <clears throat> this is one of those things that I fully understand that it's it's so hard to to listen, take notes, do the stream, ask questions, answer questions, and that's why the replay is so great. And Chris, thank you to you to giving a shout out to Kiri. She does a great job helping me out with all of this. And also a shout out to Heidi. Heidi and Jay are great moderators. They're awesome with their information and helping in the in the chat as well. And I know um, that, that they probably have that issue too. They're so busy answering a question that you might be asking that they're not always here listening to the live stream. They're so dedicated. They are so good at being moderators and looking out for all of you who are asking the questions that they're also missing out on, on some of the live stream as well. But 
you guys are great in all the efforts that you're making in all of this. Okay, let's see. Dave Meek says, pest and wildlife damage doesn't matter when you overplant times three. That That is great. And I actually uh, made note of that. I'm working on a, a video about planting that I'll probably be releasing in uh, a couple weeks. And I did mention it in the video that I did a couple weeks ago about overplanting. I think that's a great idea. Now, the, the video that will be coming up, I'll be talking more about plants as sacrificial plants. That's what I call them. Uh, they're also known as magnet plants, where you have a plant in your garden that is specifically grown to attract pests so that the, the pests attack that plant and leave the rest of your plants alone. So great technique. It's one that, that I do regularly. The other part of it is exactly to your point. If, if I want a harvest, I overplant. I grow more of that plant than I really need, anticipating that there's going to be pest damage, there's going to be weather damage, there's going to be something that's going to impact my harvest, and especially when you live in an environment like mine where the weather is so extreme. And as you may have seen last year, I had terrible results in my garden because we had a hailstorm that devastated the garden both early and late, and then a very early freeze. So I didn't have much of a harvest. But in most years, I can correct for some of that. There's still going to be damage. So by planting three plants, Knowing that that damage is going to come, I can make sure that I have at least some of the harvest that I'm after. So great suggestion. Three plants is often better than one unless you live in an ideal environment where you don't have those kind of losses. Jay is saying, we try to multitask, but I try to re-listen to the live stream and reread the comments that there's too much to process at any moment. Uh, and, and, you know, that, that's, that's almost a nice problem to have. There is so much information on these Gardener's Scott live stream. I do the same thing. I go back uh, partly just to remember what it was I was talking about, either before or after Kiri gets the timestamps done, but also to see your comments as well, uh, because there is just too much to take up all at once. So this is a great opportunity just to throw this in the library, and all this information is there. That's why I keep doing it, is to provide that information. Carla, thank you. Thumbs up that button. Show Gardner Scott how much we appreciate his efforts. Uh, thank you. I appreciate that. That's always nice. Um, Mage Grey Wolf is saying, I work out how many plants I think I'll need, then double that. Great idea. Great idea. Still, still growing more than you need. And I do that actually from the seedling point. I, my tomatoes are doing great. We're still at least three weeks away from me putting them out. They're about six to eight inches tall right now, and I've got over 100 tomatoes. I'm only planning on growing about 25 or 30 plants, which is about twice as much as I need, and I ended up starting about three times as much as I need in the way of seedlings. Again, anticipating that there would be problems, anticipating the loss. Well, when the loss doesn't happen, now you're stuck with 100 plants, and so I've already set up to give Kiri some, and I was talking to my neighbor a couple days ago, they're getting some of my tomatoes, and I'll be sharing them as much as I can with my garden club, but uh, I think it's better to have more, and then try to figure out what you're going to do with the excess when everything goes perfectly, than to not start with enough, and then have those problems, and you end up doing a lot of work without the results that you're that you're seeking. So a little bit of um, philosophy and how I approach my gardening. It looks like a lot of you do the same. Lorifel saying, starting a couple weeks after planting out the tomatoes, plant an extra tomato plant by a fence in the garden. The stressed tomato plant directs the hornworm plants, the horn, hornworm moths away from the rest of the tomatoes. Yeah, great idea. Again, that, that concept of the sacrificial plant. And, and you raise a very good point. The insect pests are more likely to attack a stressed plant. And so if you intentionally put in that sacrificial plant in an area where it's going to be stressed, it is more likely to be attacked as the sacrifice, as that magnet plant. 
And then the rest of your garden that you're taking care of, that you're watering and that the soil is nice and mended and everything's going great because the good garden grows where the good gardener goes and that's where you're going, those plants are more likely to be successful than that one scraggly plant that gets eaten by all the bugs. So um, great idea, great idea. And and and, and like Lorifel says, plant it out by the fence. You, you don't need to, to do a lot close by. So uh, insects can travel a, a great distance. And so if you put your sacrificial plant 20, 30 feet away from your garden, chances are that the insects are going to find that plant and it's really going to keep them away from your main garden area. You don't you don't have to do this side by side. In fact, you really shouldn't do it side by side because if you have a stressed plant that the insects are attacking and then right next to it is a healthy plant, well, once they get done with the stressed plant, they're going to look next door and go, oh, there's the same kind of food. Let's make it stressed so we can invite in all of our cousins and we'll take out both plants. So yeah, separating them is actually a really good idea. Paul saying, I'm having bird problems considering hoops with bird net mesh, but I'm wondering how you harvest with them, or is there some point the plants are safe? Uh, so with, with all of my coverings on hoops, I primarily use spring clamps to hold them in place. So when I put the hoops over my bed and then I cover with plastic or I cover with bird mesh, I'll hold them in place with the spring clamps. And the spring clamps are those kind that you... You squeeze and it, it opens up and then it clamps back down because it's activated with a spring. And so when it comes time to work in that bed or to harvest or do anything, if you just roll up one side and then clamp it onto the hoop, you've now opened up the whole bed. And so I, I don't have any issues with working in the beds that have any type of cover on them. You just roll it up and clamp it out of your way and you can access it easily. Now, in some areas, so like my strawberries, where I, I grow strawberries in open beds, I did this at my last garden, and I covered them with hoops and bird netting to keep the birds out. I did put garden staples in the bottom of the, 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 the mesh, the bird fabric to hold it to the ground so that birds and squirrels couldn't crawl underneath. In that case, yes, there's an extra step. You need to pull out the staple, then you pull up the, the mesh and you clamp it in place so you can work in it. And at some point, you probably don't need to have it covered anymore. It depends on the plant, depends on the fruit, it depends on the pest, it depends on the bird. If you know it's a bird that's eating your fruit, then it's more likely that the bird is going to be attacking your fruit when it's ripe. So you really don't need that, that cover while the, the fruit is growing because most birds are not going to eat unripe fruit, but they know when it's ripe. So covering it during the harvest time is really the only time that you'll usually need to cover a fruit that's being eaten by a bird. So understand the pest, understand when they eat whatever part of the plant they're eating, and then you can put your protection in place to match the, the basically the diet of the, the pest so that you disrupt. They're looking for that fruit, you've got bird netting over it, and they're not gonna be able to get to your fruit, so they'll go someplace else to eat. So you don't have to have it in for the whole season. You really only need to have your cover in in the time that the pests are attacking. And so like talking about earlier where we were talking about what's eating the top of a bean plant and that you might want to cover it. Well, early in the season for beans and peas and those young delectable plants that like to be eaten by animals and insects alike, you cover it with a, a row fabric so that nothing can get in. Once that seedling has grown to the point where four, five, six, seven sets of true leaves are growing and it's a full-size plant, you can take that row cover off because now those same insects that would have eaten it when it was a seedling, they've either grown to a point where they're, they're not in that part of their life cycle where they're cutting down the stem or they're being eaten by birds or you've dealt with them in some other way. So typically, if you can just cover 
during that critical part of the life cycle of the pest. Once you're past that point, you can take the cover off and usually have some pretty good results. Okay, let's see what else we have popping up. Um, Jenny's uh, commenting to Gardner Kevin, do you have a better concentration on the peroxide? I have no idea what I'm doing. Okay, so I didn't see the original comment from Kevin probably talking about using hydrogen peroxide in the soil, which can be quite effective. Uh, that is one of those things. I don't do it a lot just because I don't typically have a need for it, um, but I'll go back later and try to see what the what the issue is with all of that. I do want to talk a little bit um, specifically about soil and some things you should be thinking about right now with your soil. Now, I had a great gardening week this last week where I was out almost every day for a long time and I spread a bunch of manure. You'll see that video coming up this weekend. I, I added some amendment to some of my other beds. I'm doing very well in getting my new big surrounded bed area filled with soil and all of it has to deal with making the soil better for me and my plants in my garden. And so at every stage of gardening, to include planning, when it's winter and you're planning out your garden, I suggest that you consider the soil. And we, we focus on the seeds and we focus on the plants and watering and weeding and harvesting and all those kind of things. But at some point, you really need to bring soil awareness into every aspect of gardening. And so for planning purposes, as you're planning out what you're going to do in your garden, build the soil into your plan. When are you going to amend it? How are you going to amend it? When are you going to mulch it? How are you going to mulch it? That, those are all considerations that deal with the plants that you're going to be growing at different points. Also, think about the types of amendments that you might be using. Now, I make my own potting mixes. Works the same way with most of the potting mixes that you're going to buy. So in beds that I amended last fall, I don't often do much in the way of amending in spring depending on what the plant is. Now, if I'm going to be transplanting plants that I grew in my potting mix, I know that my potting mix has compost in it. It has worm castings in it. It has some nutrient value and some slow release fertilizer in it. So I can put those potted plants into my beds and in the process, I'm improving the soil because all of the soil that was in that pot is now in my bed. And so that's, that's one way to add nutrients to a, a bed during the growing season by just adding more potted plants and the soil within that pot already has some extra nutrients. It isn't a widespread amending of the bed. It doesn't fix the whole bed, but it can give a, a, a boost to that soil during the growing season. One reason why I like organic mulch all the time on the soil, especially during the growing season, is for those beds where the plants are growing. When you use something like straw, like I, I prefer, it will begin to break down. Not only does it uh, protect the soil, but it also does add some organic matter to the soil. It's not packed with nutrients, but it does add a little bit of that organic component to the soil. And then as the season progresses, I look forward to late season when I'm going to amend the beds again. It, it really does come down to the soil. And you've probably heard me say this in some of my videos that soil is key to success in your garden. Colorado State University, as I learned in the Master Gardener program, says that 80% of plant problems can be tied to the soil. And so a lot of those plants that are stressed and not doing well, it's probably a soil issue that's causing that plant to be stressed. If you focus on improving your soil by adding all that organic matter, by encouraging the microbial activity, by encouraging fungal activity, you're going to improve your soil. It takes time. This isn't one of those do it once and it's fixed forever, but it is one of those things that you can 
keep doing over time to improve your soil. Now, you can't overdo it. And so on the Gardner Scott Channel membership Facebook page, we had some discussion today because one of the members had done a soil test and found out that her soil actually had extreme levels of some of the nutrients. Specifically, the I think it was the the phosphorus that was too high, or maybe the potassium that was too high, and also had very high levels of magnesium and sulfur. And so this is where your own education in soil really becomes important because there's a lot of quick fixes out there. And I've said many, many times, you should have a soil test done in your garden so you identify what your soil is deficient in, but also, as in this case, what it has too much of. Because especially the macronutrients, if you've got too much phosphorus in your soil, it can actually hinder the uptake of some of the other nutrients that the plants can need. Forget the fact that it's, it's possibly a problem if you have too many nutrients that they'll leach out and now contaminate your groundwater and cause some of those algae blooms that you've heard about. A lot of that comes from the fertilizer that's being washed downstream. And you don't want to be a culprit in that problem. So forget that that's happening. Let's assume that it isn't that extreme. But things that you're doing to your soil without fully understanding what you're doing can cause problems. You no doubt have heard that Epsom salts are great for tomatoes. Well, Epsom salts will give the, your soil magnesium and sulfur. Really, it doesn't work like it's, it's being touted. But if you've got a soil that's already high in magnesium and already high in sulfur, by you using Epsom salts, you're making that even worse. And it's the same kind of thing. That magnesium can be drawn up into the plant and it locks out a lot of those other nutrients. So I, I, I'm not a big fan of fertilizing without knowing what your soil needs. There's this assumption that the plants are doing bad, so we need to fertilize and we need to fertilize with nitrogen. In many cases, our soils are deficient in nitrogen, but it's all that other stuff that we need to be aware of before we automatically fertilize. By amending with organic matter, we tend to create a more stable environment. Those nutrients tend to be a little more balanced. But over time, you can get to the point where you've got too many nutrients in your soil because you're amending it too much. And you probably haven't heard this said very much, but there comes a time when you should stop adding organic matter to your soil because it can be overdone. It can get too rich. And the best way to figure this out is with a soil test. But it, it's counterintuitive. Your plants are suffering because the soil's bad. So over a period of years, you amend it, you amend it, amend it. The plants start doing great, start doing wonderful. And then at some point, the plants start suffering again. And you're tearing your hair out trying to figure out why are my plants doing terrible this year because they did so good last year. I'm amending with compost. Well, it may be because you've just reached one of those points where a nutrient is too high and the plants are suffering. So learn more about your own specific soil with a test. And that's the best way to approach how you amend and what kind of fertilizers, if any, you add to your soil. Yankee Sista, hello to you. Can you recommend a straw that doesn't contain a lot of grass seed? I bought a packaged straw. So uh, the, the straw I get, I, I, I'm not aware of a, a brand name of straw that I would recommend. I just give whatever I have at my local ranch center. What you can do is ask about the source of the straw or if you buy from a particular garden center or nursery or ranch store, and you see that there's always a problem with weeds, then I suggest go someplace else. But you can deal with that issue. Now, straw is not supposed to have many seeds in it. The, the grain that the straw comes from, and there are many different types of straws, the grain is harvested, the tops are cut off to be used typically 
as a feed for animals or for us to make some kind of flour. And then the stock that's left behind is packaged as straw. So there shouldn't be any seeds, but it's, it's normal as that straw is being picked up by the harvester that there's going to be some seeds in it. One of the things that, that I like to do, and uh, it's, it's part of my regular activity, is to buy the, the straw well ahead of time. I'll leave it outside and let it, let it be exposed to the rain and the snow. And as I get closer to the time that I'm going to use it in my garden, I'll water my straw bale with the intent of causing those seeds that are in the straw bale to sprout. And once I have those, those seeds that have sprouted, then I just let the straw bale dry out again, and that kills all of those young plants that were starting to grow in the straw bale. So that takes planning where you're going to get your straw, you're going to intentionally water it to grow what's in any of the seeds that are inside of it, but that can be a pretty effective way to get rid of those seeds. Now, when you spread it in your garden as a mulch, you should have fewer issues with the, the straw weeds popping up. Chris, thank you so much for that contribution. The mods have been great in helping me. I have two Granny Smith apple trees planted six feet apart, planted last spring. Is it too late to move them? Uh, are they okay? Um, it's, it's better to try to move some of those plants when they're, they're dormant. Uh, I, I wouldn't say it's too late. I have moved, uh, I think, no, it wasn't a Granny Smith. It was a Yellow Delicious. I did move about a, 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 a small apple tree years ago and when it was actively growing. And it took a couple years for it to recover to the point before I moved it. Because it's really difficult. You want to try to get as much of the root ball as you can. You want to try to avoid disturbing those roots as much as possible. But when a plant, like a tree, is actively growing, and you get in and you cut those roots, and then you pull out the tree, and then you move it to another spot, it can stress it to the point that, that it'll take a while for it to recover. So if you planted last spring, chances are the roots haven't grown excessively and you might have more success with it if you do it this year. Uh, just be careful. <clears throat> Again, try to dig out as much of the root ball as possible without disrupting it move it into its spot right away that's the holes already dug and prepared and you might be okay. But if you're going to do it this year, yeah, I would say do it now while conditions are still cool and before the tree is really actively growing and you might have better success with it. I wouldn't do it during the middle of the summer because you're really going to stress the tree and I would hesitate moving a tree in the fall because that's when it's putting a lot of its energy into the roots. And now if you cut off those roots and move it, you're taking away energy for that tree next year. So if you're gonna do it, go ahead and do it now. Just be very careful about it. Jenny's saying, why do my seed sprouts stop growing after they pop up? I'm growing them in small containers outside, too cold, too wet, I'm confused. Uh, yeah, it could definitely be too cold and too wet. <clears throat> it depends on what kind of seed it is. Uh, there are a lot of plants that like the cool conditions and should be able to sprout and grow. If it's a plant like a tomato or a pepper or an eggplant or a squash or a melon and it's too cold out, then that could definitely be the issue. They, the soil temperature is too cold. And so if you're growing in a container outside and that soil temperature drops below a 60 degrees Fahrenheit, about 15 degrees Celsius, those warm season plants are, aren't gonna like it. They're gonna suffer, they're gonna be stunted, and they might die. So that could definitely be an issue that the soil temperature is too cool when you're starting to grow outside in a container. And water is always a possibility. Overwatering is most likely when we're growing seedlings, but if you're growing outside, underwatering is often an issue because the sun dries out the soil in that pot and it can kill the plant. And so do check the soil moisture if you're growing seedlings outside in containers because it's one of those things that you may need to water two, three, four, five times a day 
depending on what the weather's like because it could be drying out the soil pretty quickly and killing the plants. That's something that you kind of have to be aware of and be concerned about. Carla Garner saying, best idea to get organic straw. I mean, a pyrolids can last two years and is effective even at a few grams. Uh, and, and that's one, another reason I'm, I'm still working on that video. I hope to have it out soon where I'll be talking about straw and amino pyrrolids. And that's, that's one of my solutions as well. That's why I buy straw ahead of time, leave it out in the elements. Depends on the herbicide that is used in the straw. Most of the time, the people that sell you the straw have no clue. Some of those amino pyrrolids have a half-life of 12 months and so that's the point when it's deemed that it's not as effective and it won't cause as much harm but they can still cause harm there are many many other herbicides that are sprayed on those cereal crops that the straw comes from and they can last many many months they might have a half-life of three months or six months but they can still cause problems that's that's why i put my straw bales out hopefully to leach out those chemicals as much as possible but also over a period of time to dissipate the harmful effects. But if you can find organic straw that has not been sprayed, then you shouldn't have those issues. And so that's a good suggestion. If you can find it, uh, it is something you can try to avoid. Uh, if you can find the straw, it's the issue of avoiding the herbicides that it might've been sprayed with. So um, definitely something to think about. Philip Warren says, good idea or bad idea to plant a very small fig tree during a three-day rain spell, or should I wait until it passes? By the way, it still needs hardened off, overcast for the next two days. I would use the next two days to harden it off. It's best to plant just about anything that you're going to transplant in the garden on an overcast day. Now, it's not a good idea to dig in wet soil. So if it's been a lot of rain and the soil is soggy, you can really disrupt the soil structure if you're digging in wet soil. Great idea to transplant on an overcast day. Not so good of an idea to transplant during a wet period of time. But if it hasn't been hardened off yet, yeah, throw it outside while it's rainy and overcast. Give that, that fig tree some exposure to the outside conditions. Hopefully the rains will stop, the soil will dry out a little bit, it'll have that little bit of hardening off, and then you can put it in the ground. Look at the forecast to see what it's going to be over the period of the next week. And it's, it's ideally going to be overcast or a, a sheltered time that you can put the, the tree in the ground. It's not such a good idea if you only harden it off for two days under clouds and then you put it in and the next day it's going to be 90 degrees and hot and sunny and that tree is going to be stressed. So do try to time it so it, it, it's either hardened off uh, before you put it into a sunny spot or hardened off and then put it into the spot and allow it to harden off underneath those cloudy conditions for the rest of the time. You can harden off plants in the ground if you have that kind of uh, weather where it's not going to be extremely cold at night and it's not going to be extremely hot during the day. Uh, I do that a, a lot. I, I harden off all my plants. But if I see that I've got a week of, of cloudy weather and without those extremes, I'll go ahead and put some of my plants directly into the ground to harden off naturally in the ground. It, it actually saves a little bit of time and can be effective for hardier plants and for perennials and for trees. It, it can work pretty well. Pat Patrick, thank you for that super chat contribution. I appreciate it. Thanks so much. Uh, Tamara Benet is saying, uh, by adding compost or mulch on top of the soil, would we still have the potential for getting too many nutrients in the soil? It's less likely because when you put something on the top of the soil like that, it does take longer for those nutrients to find their way into the soil. And so <clears throat> I just did some filming um, yesterday, as a matter, or two days ago, as a matter of fact, where I was showing uh, for a future video, and then I also mention it in the video on compost that's, or a video on manure that's coming out this weekend and it's it's thinking of the compost or a manure or a mulch 
as kind of a slow release fertilizer. So I'll do that in my perennial beds because I can't get in there and add that compost every year without digging up the plants. And so in my asparagus bed, I amended it really well once in the beginning when I got the soil ready before I put in my asparagus. After the asparagus is growing, and the same with all the other perennials in those beds, then I'll put some compost on top, I'll put some manure on top, I'll put mulch on top, and that helps keep the soil with some nutrients in it as that top breaks down. And so in that case, it really is hard for that soil to become over fertilized because what you're adding on top is basically just refurbishing what was already there. The organic matter that was in place when you first planted is being broken down over time and you're just adding more from the top instead of from inside. It's more a problem with a raised bed or an in-ground bed where you're incorporating organic matter on a regular basis. And so by adding more, adding more, adding more to the soil every year, you're much more likely to have over fertilization at some point. Adding it to the top, and I think this is one, one reason why the, the no dig method might be uh, effective, is because you're not incorporating more organic matter into the soil, you're just adding a couple inches of compost to the top each year and allowing those nutrients to replace what was already there. So you can get to the point where if you just keep adding compost to the top every year, if it's not breaking down, yeah, you could get to the point where you've got so much compost on the top that when you are planting in it, it might have too many of a particular type of nutrient. Depends on the compost, depends on how quickly it's breaking down, but it's less likely than adding it into the soil on a regular basis every single year or or worse yet i you know doing it in spring and doing it in fall every year you're probably going to have uh, an abundance of a particular nutrient over time uh, mage gray wolf is saying i tried transplanting the day before it rains there you go and i actually did that uh last week it's snowing right now rain in the forecast we did have some hot days but there were some overcast days and I put in some elderberry plants that I had inside. They had arrived as bare root and were just starting to bud and I kept them inside during those hot sunny days and I put them into the ground two days before all of this rain and snow hit. And so great idea. You can put them in the ground in a in a overcast period so they're not being stressed with the rain coming and now the rain is going to keep the soil nice and evenly moist so that those plants can get a quick boost in a, a nice sheltered weather environment and you don't have to get out there and water them so yeah that can be a very effective way to do it stephanie says garden scott thank you for the info really helpful oh, i'm so glad to help always am uh, john ann is saying i plant whenever the mood hits Morning, afternoon, evening, hot, cold, dry, wet, too impatient and impulsive to plant it out. And I, yeah, those of us that have that gardening bug do that. There is a best time. There is a best way for best results. Can you transplant in the sun? Sure. Can you transplant when the plant isn't fully grown? Sure. There's a lot of things you can do. You might not have the best success, but that's all part of the learning experience as well, as you try it and you see what happens. I, I told you I started hardening off my plants. Well, I had some zinnias that I uh, put with this flats. I think I had seven or eight flats of plants, of seedlings of various types, mainly perennial flowers that I'm hardening off to put out in my garden once the nights start getting a little warmer because We've got snow right now, it's still a little bit early. But I put some zinnias out, and the zinnias had their second set of true leaves. So they were still pretty small seedlings. And they were in a tray that had some yarrow plants that are actually quite robust and growing well. Well, I made that mistake. I was a little anxious, wanted to get those plants hardened off. All the plants did great, 
except for those few zinnias that just had a few sets of leaves on them, they weren't ready to be exposed to the full sun. Even though the first day I only put them out for two hours, the two hours of sun was enough to kill those zinnias that just hadn't grown to the point that they were ready for that much sun. So, yep, happens to all of us. We get a little anxious about our plants and we just can't hold off any longer and sometimes the plants suffer. So I, I, I know what it's like. I've killed many plants just by not being able to have the patience. That's why I tell you you should have patience because I know that that's what's caused problems in the past for me when I don't have patience. Fred Bow says garden's doing really well so far this season. Good for you and I hope all of you have great seasons. Things are going to go great and things aren't going to go great and we just keep persevering, moving ahead, and focusing on all those things that do great. So uh, let's just keep it going. Uh, Riverdale Gardens is on today. I had seen that um, comment that you were going to be here. It's good to see you, Riverdale. Do you have any experience dwarfing fruit trees? And so I, I don't have experience dwarfing a fruit tree, and I'm not sure what you mean by that question. So <clears throat> I haven't grown a dwarf rootstock and then taken a scion and grafted it onto that rootstock. And that's really uh, how you would dwarf a tree because it's the rootstock that really determines how big the tree is going to be. And so if you grow on a dwarf rootstock, you're gonna have a small tree. If you grow on a standard rootstock, you're going to have a normal size tree. Now, I do have experience, and I've got a couple of videos about espalier where I'll take a semi-dwarf tree and prune it to keep it small and so the tree itself is not a dwarf tree but it's being pruned to keep it small so if that's what you're asking yeah I've got some espalier videos that you can look at in my library that give you some ideas of what I've done and and I've got an espalier apple tree by my garage that I did the most recent video about. And I'll be doing another video in a year that shows what I did in the second year. So this, this last video was the first year of espalier and how you can prune a tree to keep it small. So that's a little bit different as far as terminology, if, if that's what you're asking as far as dwarfing a tree. I have taken some cuttings from some shoots that popped up from some of the root stock that I have in the trees and I'm trying to get them to root so that I can do some of that, uh, taking the root stock and taking a scion and grafting them together. But that's, that's a few years in the future before I get to that point. You can do pruning to keep your trees small. And, and I'll be showing that in the future because in my, my little food forest where I already have the fruit trees planted, some of those trees I do want to keep small and I'll be showing that in the future. Uh, a lot of that is how you prune. Summer pruning is a great way to keep a fruit tree smaller. If you want to encourage new branches, then you do that with the winter pruning. So I'll, I'll talk more about that in future videos, but those are some of the basic concepts. And, and yeah, I do have some experience with that. And uh, depending on exactly what it is you're looking for, it is something to get out there and try. It's kind of fun to prune trees and, and you, you can determine how they grow and how big they get. That, that can actually be kind of fun. Uh, yeah, thanks, Jay. There's a link to the espalier tree videos. I appreciate that. Thanks for throwing that out there. <clears throat> okay, let's see what else. Gary Norcal, good to see you here for Northern California Gardeners. Are you having aphid problems? Major hatch in my garden this week. And, and there was a, a, a question that popped up in the... Uh, community group uh, about aphids and, and how to deal with them. <clears throat> Depending on the time of year, I, I don't have them yet in my garden because it's still too cold and we don't have enough plants yet, but probably in about three or four weeks we'll have an aphid infestation. Happens every year, probably happens to you in your area every year. Aphids are very susceptible to death if you just spray them with a strong stream of water. And so that's typically what I do. You can even just take the plant and shake it and those aphids will fall to the ground. And if you think about it, the size of an aphid 
If it's on the top of your tomato plant and you shake the tomato plant and it falls down to the ground, think about how far that distance is. That's probably the equivalent of you jumping off a 50-story building. There's going to be some damage when you land. That aphid is probably going to break some legs or maybe be killed when it lands. If it survives the landing, well, if it was sprayed off with water, now it's probably in some mud and it's not going to be able to dig out of the mud, more likely to die. But even if it can get to the surface and, and start crawling, think about the distance. Now it has to travel just to get back to the stem to crawl back up the plant. So that's why it's just shaking off or, or spraying off the aphids can be so effective as a very simple measure. I'm not a big fan of using a pesticide to kill the aphids when they first appear because shortly after they appear, the insect predators are going to appear, the ladybugs, the lacewings. They're going to show up very close to the time that the aphids show up. And if there's aphids on your plants, then those ladybugs are going to stick around and start eating aphids. And now you've got ladybugs in your garden. And so think about that as trying to develop that balanced ecosystem where you have the insect predators taking care of your insect pests. And you can try to get rid of as many of the aphids as you want. I, I just, I think there should be some aphids in your garden so that all those other beneficial insects have food when they appear. And it gets back to that idea of the sacrificial plant where it's okay to have plants that are being eaten in your garden so that when those beneficial insects appear, they're, they're happy with your garden. It's like, oh man, we've been flying all over looking for something to eat. Look at this place. They've got a bunch of aphids. Let's hang out there. Let's lay eggs. Let's create our own population within this garden because they know what they're doing. They're giving us the food that we want. And that's the way I garden. And over time, you have so few problems. In our fourth season, I think it was, at the Galileo School Garden, we had almost no pests. The previous year, we had a lot of pests. We had them eating a lot of plants. The next year, almost nothing. And it's because I was growing flowers and herbs and grasses and all those things to attract those beneficial insects, and they took care of the pests for us. We got out there and picked off by hand the bigger ones that we could see before they went out of control. We sprayed off the aphids, and, it, and that was one of the easiest gardening years I've ever had and we were growing in, I think, 75 raised beds and didn't have to deal with the pests because nature took care of it. It's so cool when you can get to that point. Laura's saying, did you say you need to use a dwarf tree to do espalier or can you use a full-size tree but keep it small with training? You do not need to use a dwarf tree. You can use a full-size tree and with pruning, keep it small through the espalier pruning method. I use semi-dwarf rootstock just because I'm, I'm growing right next to a building and I don't want the roots to grow too far out. And so the rootstock of a dwarf uh, tree is not going to grow as far out as the roots of a standard size tree. Even when you prune it small, it's more likely that the bigger rootstock will send out more roots. And so because I'm growing it next to a building, I kind of split the difference and have semi-dwarf rootstock. But you can you can espalier uh, any type of tree, a dwarf tree, a semi-dwarf tree, an espalier, espalier a standard full-size tree. You'll probably have more options for the, the size and the shape if you grow with a full-size tree, just because it's it's going to grow more, but it also means you're going to have to do more pruning. Whereas a dwarf tree that you're espaliering uh, won't require as much pruning just because it's going to be growing slower and isn't going to be as big uh, uh, to start with or to finish with, depending on how you look at it. Okay, let's see what else we have. Farmer X72, hello everyone from Swamp Donkey Gardens. Hope all have a great gardening day. You too. Thanks for all the information. They're very welcome. Glad to help. Heidi's wondering about the garden behind me. This is my garden. Last week, I showed you my garden from last year, and it was the opposite side of the garden. So it was the, the complete opposite end. This is my garden from last year. 
a different view. These are some of my tomato plants that are directly behind me. And then behind them are, uh, let's see, these are some of my squash plants actually, and some of my cucumbers. Over here, I have some cucumbers that are growing up, trellises, and a lot of the other plants. So, uh, like I said last week, I'm just chomping at the bit to get out there and do some, my garden, but it's still too early. Things aren't growing, and so I need this motivation to see what my garden looked like last year so that I can get the encouragement to get out there and do all the work that needs to be done so that I can have my garden look like this, or even better this year. I'm anticipating uh, a lot more this year because I've been adding some beds and getting them ready for a lot more plants. But thank you for asking that. Yes, it is my, my garden today. And uh, I do have a few more gardens of yours that are in the queue that uh, maybe I can start showing next week once we get caught up with all of that. And if you want to show me your garden, especially your, your, your new garden, your young garden, I'll, I'll be glad to put it in the background of one of these live streams. Just send it to me. Send it to Gardener Scott at GardenerScott.com and give me permission to use it, and I'll throw it up there. And, and I have gotten some photos that I haven't used, and often it's because you say, here's a picture of my garden, but you haven't said that it's okay for me to use it in a live stream as the background. And so for copyright considerations and for your own privacy concerns, I, I will usually not put up a background if you send me a picture without telling me that the reason you're sending me the picture is so that I can show it as a background. So do try to be specific. And if you've got a, a backstory about your gardening, about your garden, about the plants you're growing. I, I love to hear that too, so that I can talk about it in the, the live stream when I show it as a background. So there you go, Jay, always on top of things. Thanks for putting that in there. I, I think it's, it's great. Um, Kay Russell says, I truly believe gardeners are the biggest gluttons for punishment. And that's so true. We, we go into it knowing things are going to go wrong knowing that the birds and the insects are going to eat our harvest, knowing that it's going to be hard. But that's, that's why I like doing it, because when those successes happen, they just mean so much more, because we have been punishing ourselves. And so when you can have that first of whatever, my raspberries are doing great. So last year I put in eight or ten heritage raspberries and I've got oh probably 40 or 50 plants that are popping up now because raspberries just spread so so well when you give them a happy environment and mine are in a happy environment and so I'm going to have 40 or 50 raspberry shoots popping up here pretty soon which means I should have a nice little harvest of raspberries this year and that very first raspberry, there's no way it ever makes it into the kitchen. When I see that first ripe raspberry, I'm plucking it off and eating it. And it's well worth all the effort of preparing the bed, getting the plants, putting those plants in, waiting a year for them to get to the point where they're going to start fruiting, and then enjoying the fruit. And that holds true with everything else in the garden. It just, we all know it tastes better, but I think a lot of the reason that our fruit tastes better in our own garden is because of all the punishment we put ourselves through to get to that point. And I say punish yourself because the, the, the results of that success make it well worth it. So uh, yeah, there you go, Jay. It's Gardner Scott at GardnerScott.com. Okay, Chris is saying uh, we're punishing ourselves when it's easy. Uh, when it comes to an end, we have a platform or we've got a problem. I'm not sure what you're saying. Um, in the end, regardless of how much you punish yourself, even if it doesn't turn out the way you hoped, you've learned so much for the next year to do it right and to get it better that next time. So I think a little bit of punishment is okay. James is saying, my asparagus are sprouting up today. I was nervous they would not come back. And I, was it last week? I'm not sure if it was in the live stream or if it was in Facebook. Someone was asking about the asparagus and not coming up yet. And I said, have some patience. It, it might have been you, James. Um, and wait a week, especially with the brand new asparagus that you put into the ground, 
Yeah, it comes up. It may take longer than you were anticipating, but when it does, that's another one of those really good feelings when you put a plant and you're waiting and you're hoping, then suddenly it pops up. My asparagus is doing pretty good, and, and I've been keeping an eye on it, and everything that was there in the ground last year is sending up a spear this year. So even I have that that hesitation and trepidation wondering if the plants are going to return after the winter and it's so nice when they do okay let's let's get into a little bit of the philosophy phase as we start winding things up today um it i, I had a, a really good gardening week you know i talked about the stuff i did outside but i noticed in my my homepage feed on youtube and this is one of those reasons that I suggest that if you haven't subscribed to Garden Scott channel, go ahead and subscribe, click on the bell. That way, when all of my videos come out, you can see them coming out, decide if it's one you want to see or not want to see. But there's so many of you I know that either have subscribed and haven't clicked the bell or haven't subscribed, and you don't see the opportunity of my videos coming out. Well, one of the channels I subscribe to is Alberta Urban Garden. And... Stephen from Alberta, Canada has not made videos in years, but I am subscribed to the channel, hoping that at some point he'll make videos again. And I do the same with a couple other channels. Well, this week, Stephen released a new video for the first time in years. It's a very short video about making compost. It's got some really good information in it, very, very succinct. But I encourage you to check out the Alberta Urban Garden uh, YouTube channel. And, and when you do, tell him that Gardener Scott sent you. He doesn't know me. I made a comment that he responded to. But he's been out of the mix for a while. And I think it's a great channel. I encourage you to check it out. Let him know that Gardener Scott sent you. And maybe at some point I'll have him on the channel. Now the reason I bring this up is because Stephen at Alberta Urban Garden was one of the channels that really got me interested and motivated to do a channel of my own. And so about four years ago, I was, I was watching all of his stuff. And he takes a very scientific approach to the gardening. And he, if there's a question about the, whether chlorine, will, uh, chlorine in the water will affect your plants, well, he has a video where he's actually done laboratory analysis of water and, and shows the effects on the garden and bacteria in water and all the rest. He's, he's just got some great videos with some really good scientific information. And he's just a garden gardener with a small garden in his backyard in Alberta, Canada, with some challenging conditions. But when I started watching his videos years ago, I recognized that he knew what he was talking about. And that allowed me, when I started watching other videos, to recognize when these other videos didn't know what they were talking about. And that's what I want to talk about today. If you go to a doctor and you have some terrible diagnosis, you're told to get a second opinion. I suggest you do that with gardening, on YouTube, with the videos. I love giving them the information. I can tell you most of my information is accurate. Most of it is scientifically and research-based. Some of it is from my own experience, and there may not be research to support it. But I can't guarantee you that my information is going to be best for your garden. And so as you are finding out a new way to do things, as you're improving upon the experience and the knowledge you have, it's great that you're here. It's great that you're following me on Mondays. It's great that you're subscribing. It's great that you're watching my videos. But get a second opinion. And Alberta Urban Garden is one of those channels that I go to for a second opinion when I'm trying to do research and trying to find more information. And there's a lot of channels out there that, that I encourage you to seek out as well. Epic Gardening is a channel that is doing extremely well right now. He takes the same approach as far as giving you information that he's tested, that he's done, that he can actually show you what to do. Haven't met him, hope to someday, but that's a channel I go to for some really good information. 
There's a lot of others out there. I've got some videos where I talk about this. I've talked about it in previous live streams. Uh, the simp uh, Simplified Gardening, Tony in the UK is another one of those channels that just great information, very factual, and the kind that you can get some good information. It doesn't always balance. Hugh Richards is another UK channel that I love. He's got great information, but he did a video recently and it doesn't match with how I do things. And so we've got uh, some videos that are presenting some similar information about transplanting in the garden. And the way he does it is different than the way I do it. And this is why I say get a second opinion. Just because I'm giving you 10 things that could go wrong with your transplanting, that's what the video was last week, 10 mistakes that are common in transplanting. If you watch Hugh Richards' video on transplanting, you'll see that we're not saying the exact same thing. Most of what we say is the same, but there are a few differences. And so when you check out another gardener's video or blog or book, and it doesn't match with what the first person told you, now you can start asking yourself, well, why? Why don't they match? It could be the environment. It could be that I'm growing at 7,500 foot elevation in dry and windy Colorado, or it could be that he's growing in a cooler, wetter environment in the UK. Different gardens, different situations might give you different results. And so the information may be good from both of us. You've got to find which one matches you. Had some discussion on the community group this week about a particular northern gardener with a very popular channel saying one of the ways to control slugs is to put four inches of sand around your beds. Well, the concept is that sand is dry and slugs don't like to crawl across dry materials so four inches of a sand layer around your bed will keep them out. Well, for those of you that live in areas with slugs, you've probably seen the slime trails that go across a sidewalk. So you've got a three foot wide dry concrete sidewalk that slugs will crawl across to get to the other side. So I know from experience that four inches of sand is not going to be enough to deter slugs, especially after a rain or in moist conditions. At the, at the Galileo School Garden, we had crushed granite on the surface everywhere. The soil was terrible, so we, we, do, we did almost all of our growing in raised beds. We brought in soil for the raised beds because the crushed granite was sterile and dry, and we couldn't grow anything in it. Twice in different years, I found a salamander well within our garden. There was a creek that was about 200, 250 feet away from the garden. Well, during the rains, when it was extremely wet for a period of time, the salamander, which requires wet conditions, left the creek, crawled up the hill, crawled into the garden, crawled across all of that dry crushed granite that wasn't dry anymore because of all the rains and found its way into our garden. And in both cases, what I found was a dead salamander because it crawled during the wet conditions. And then when things reverted back to their normal dry state, it wasn't enough for them to survive. But point being to this story is you'll find anomalies everywhere as far as insects and pests and plants. You have to look at, at the information that's being presented. And four inches of sand really isn't enough to deter slugs. So when you see a video that says that, don't automatically take that gardener at their word as an expert, because it might work in their garden, where it's always dry, four inches of sand might work. But for you, in a wet environment where a salamander can crawl 250 feet across dry ground, well, a little bit of sand is not going to stop slugs. Always seek out more information. Always seek out that second opinion if you discover something that's new or different when it comes to gardening. So many people, when I was working at, as a master gardener, we would often work at the help desk, a place where gardeners could come and we would answer their questions. 
so many people that had moved here to Colorado from California, Tennessee, Louisiana, places that had a completely different type of weather. And then they come to Colorado and they garden the way that they had been gardening or the way that they were told to garden. And then they come here and they have no success at all because our conditions are completely different. Well, good on them for coming to a Colorado master gardener to ask the question. That's getting a second opinion. It's saying, hey, I was able to grow anything I wanted in California and I can't grow any of that in Colorado. Why? Well, ask that question. Be the one to recognize that the way you're doing it might not be the best way. It might be because you're doing it based on what somebody told you. Well, maybe that somebody has a different garden, has a different climate, has different weather patterns. And it works for them, but it might not work for you. Question me. When I suggest that you do something, don't take me as the absolute expert in that subject. You've got to ask yourself the question, is it going to be right for you? And I try to be broad-based, and I try to give some information that's suitable for most of us, but it's not necessarily suitable for all of us. So question how you garden. Get a second opinion when you're trying something new or different. And my guess is you'll have better success in the long run because you can compare methods and then figure out which one works best in your garden and which one you prefer to do. And then you're more likely to continue gardening and have all that success that you're looking for. Rick, thank you so much for that contribution, that super chat. Thanks from Ohio. Hello to you in Ohio. I hope you have a wonderful gardening season ahead. I hope everybody, I hope this is a really great week. This is going to be... Uh, more of an inside week for me just because of the weather we've got over the next couple of days. But I'm going to get back out as soon as I can and do some more seeds and do some more plants and do some more work and fill some more beds and all the other stuff and start hardening. I, so back to the hardening off idea. I had to suspend my hardening off. I had started my plants for three days hardening them off and then saw the forecast that temperatures weren't going to drop back down close to freezing and we were going to get the snow. I had to bring all those plants back inside and just did a little bit of, of, a, of a hesitation in the hardening off. Two days from now, after this weather clears, I'm going to go back outside and do hardening off. So you can change your mind. You can change what you're doing at any point. Don't feel that you have to be locked in. Back to the idea of getting that second opinion. Just because you start doing things one way, because you were told that's the way to do it, doesn't mean you have to keep doing things that way. You can be flexible. You can modify. You can move in a different direction. Whatever works best for you. That's what it's all about. So we've reached the end of our time on this Monday. I hope you have a great gardening week ahead. I hope to see you back here next Monday where we do the same thing at the same time. We talk all about the garden, help you with the questions you have, the issues you might be concerned about, and it's all to help you become better gardeners. I'm Gardener Scott. Enjoy gardening.